It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about on Tuesday. Something happened while I was sleeping. Uh, 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 Vice President Kamala Harris, eh, she picked her uh, her running mate. And that running mate is Minnesota Governor Tim Walls. I know all the betting lines, the, uh, uh, the, the Vegas lines had Josh Shapiro as the favorite. But, you know, maybe some of the scandal that had popped up tarnished some of that luster. I don't know. Or, you know, quite frankly, maybe Harris was looking for what she got. Uh, the everyman, the working class guy, the guy next door that you want to have a beer with. Because if Tim Walls is anything, he's radically, extremely normal. <laughs> I mean, that, that's it. He's the guy you'd probably be in behind in the grocery store, wouldn't even know who he was. Uh, he's the kind of politician politician that I've been saying for years we should be wanting universally across the board. Red hat, blue hat, green hat, no hat. This this is the guy. This is somebody who gets it. Somebody who's lived lived the life that the vast majority of people have. Except he then ran for Congress, became governor, now the VP pick. And what's going on is, what's interesting is watching the, the Trump response, watching the Republican response, very predictable. This is the guy we wanted. Yo, yeah, he's got, it's a gold mine of oppo research. And then they come out with, yo, he's tampon Tim. What? I thought he was the, the, the oppo research gold mine. And the best you can come up with is he put tampons in all the bathrooms in, in Minneapolis schools? That Free? Free? Did that? And containers to throw them away? Really? He did that? Oh my gosh. That's that that's actually, you know, useful. Um, and, and look, what's interesting is you go to uh to Wisconsin where the, the RNC had their their little powwow, their little political theater uh show down there. Um, they were literally wearing tampons on the air. I'll bet you they had to buy them. I'll bet you that's why they're upset. Uh, because in in Minnesota, they're free. <laughs> no, I mean, but seriously, this is the best you got? Then they went after his military service because uh, he retired to run for governor uh, before a deployment. So that, oh, he, he quit. You know, he's a coward. You You know where that's going. And what's interesting is there's a, a Twitter account that, that goes after people with stolen valor. And it, it seems that, well, no. <laughs> it seems like everything the man has said, he did. He did. This is a guy who was a school teacher, social studies teacher for years, taught kids, lived on a teacher's salary. This is a guy who coached high school football, won a state championship. This is the kind of guy that I don't know, rural America might really like uh, a get her done kind of Democrat who's saying, hey, uh, we need to get people back to work. We need to make sure that those jobs pay good wages with good benefits so that you can keep a roof over the head. This is a guy who might be stand up and fight for education and say, we got to stop all of this privatization nonsense. We got to fund the classroom. We got to fund teachers. Wouldn't that be refreshing? Now, what's interesting to me as, as, uh, a teamster. And I, I got to go back to this because all of the unions have come out uh, and said, Hey, what a great choice this was. You know, Tim Walls, Walls is a labor guy, was a union member. Uh, this is a guy who's been on the right side of labor issues his entire career. Uh, everyone, great choice, Kamala. We're behind you, except my union, the teamsters, uh, their social media, uh, nothing zip. I, I saw nothing. And it's amazing to me that that the social media team there at the Teamsters haven't been directed to at least say, hey, a former union member is on a, a presidential ticket. Um, you know, never mind the fact that he's got an amazing record on working class issues. But they will they will praise Josh Hawley when Josh Hawley grandstanded in front of the cameras uh, going after a CEO, which, you know, hey, I'm all in favor of attacking CEOs. When they need it. Uh, but that was a grandstanding moment. 
And I couldn't help but think going back to Sean O'Brien's speech at the RNC where he said the Teamsters and the GOP may not agree on many issues, but a growing group has shown the courage to sit down and consider points of view that aren't funded by big money think tanks. Senators like J.D. Vance. What? J.D. Vance, the vulture capitalist who supports company unions? You mean that guy? Do you know who supports union issues? Do you know? Go look closer. Do you know who it is? It's Tim freaking Walls. The guy who won a state championship as a football coach. <laughs> that guy. A guy who can literally fix his own car. Um, I look at Donald Trump and, and J.D. Vance. I wonder if they, they know how to turn it on. This is a guy who fought for paid sick and paid medical leave. This is a guy who made uh, investments in affordable housing and rental assistance. This is a guy who who banned non-competes. This is a guy who pushed for stronger workplace safety laws. This is a guy who this is a guy who's been there for working people. Someone that state Republicans called uh, they called his agenda bonkers. You know, paid sick and medical leave for families who need it. That's just bonkers. Safer workplaces? Oh my gosh, bonkers. How'd Donald Trump respond? <laughs> uh, Donald Trump on his truth social. What are the chances that crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of the U.S., whose presidency was unconstitutionally stolen from him by Kamala, Barack Hussein Obama, crazy Nancy Pelosi, shifty Adam Schiff, crying Chuck Schumer, and the others on the lunatic, lunatic left crashes the Democratic National Convention and tries to take back the nomination, beginning with challenging me to another debate. What freaking planet is this guy living on? Uh, he goes on to say uh, of Biden, he feels that he has made a historically tragic mistake by handing over the U.S. presidency. A coup! to the people in the world he hates most. And he wants it back now. What's wrong with this guy? Seriously. And, you know, the, the, the Tim Walls frame of weird, quite weird. Quite frankly, extremely freaking weird. And, and what's, again, weird to me is we're in this moment where uh, there's a labor union that is, is justifying the Trump era. You're kind of just poo-pooing it aside. When we know Project 2025 is all about destroying organized labor. It's all about pushing for company unions again. We're going to make company unions great again. And we know what those are, right? Those are suggestion box unions. You don't actually get to demand anything. You don't get to, to negotiate for anything. You get to suggest things that, of course, well, <laughs> are never going to really be considered. But you, at least you get the feeling of participating. Uh, so we're going to have a big, big kumbaya kind of union where everyone gets along and listens to the boss. Never mind fighting for better wages, hours, conditions. Never mind having a voice in the workplace. You have a suggestion box. What could be worse than that? Want to hear your thoughts. Uh, what do you think of, of Tim Walls as a choice? I think is an excellent choice. I think Kamala Harris hit this one out of the park. And as, as first decisions go, thumbs up. Way to go, Kamala. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, my friend Matt McMillan is going to be here. Mac McNeil is going to be here to share some thoughts on, on this pick. Back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. 
We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, again, some some big news. Uh, Maybe you've heard. Uh, We've got a VP candidate, uh, Tim Walls, governor of Minnesota, and and social media telling me that Minneapolis is a a hellscape of ashes, burned out buildings, and apocalyptic hellhole. And here to share some thoughts on, well, is, is that reality? I've asked our good friend Mac McNeil to come share some thoughts. He's the afternoon host over at KTNF AM 950, uh, the progressive voice of Minneapolis. Matt, thanks for taking time for us. My pleasure here. And for an apocalyptic hellhole, it's got good restaurants, man. So so how yeah. bad? How, did, are, are, you, are you cooking the buildings? Uh, how, how bad is it in the, uh, the, the burnt out hellscape of, of Minneapolis? It's so bad that earlier this year, the city of Minneapolis, St. Paul, was ranked as the highest rated city in the United States on the happiness index uh, worldwide cities. I think we were in the 20s, which is pretty dang high for a U.S. city. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're doing OK. You know, it's it's like I said, there's lots of great things to do in, a, in this apocalyptic hellhole. So <laughs> but it must be the drive through abortion clinics and the quickie gender transition outlets that are littering your st- strip malls, because that's all I've been hearing. It's it's a hellhole and it's all gender transition and, and abortion clinics everywhere. It's it's just that they hate people. You know, there it's like every major city. You get people whose whole goal is just to hate on it. And we don't want you here anyway. Stay out. You're, you're, you're scared of the city. That's fine. Don't act like you went into a tertiary suburb and you went into the deep, dark city. No, we don't need you. We're perfectly happy. Minneapolis, St. Paul kicks ass. It's a magnificent town. I love it here. Rick, you've been here before. It's a wonderful town. And the reality is, is that one of the reasons why it is so good is Tim Walls. The governor has been a fantastic governor for us. And, you know, it's if if caring for your fellow human being is such a bad thing, well, guilty as charged. Yeah, okay. I, you know, I keep saying we should be starting dads for walls because he, he looks like my neighbor. Oh, he, he's he is one of the most genuine down to earth people you've ever met. I've interviewed him a few times. Uh, I met him once face to face. Just an absolute nice guy. And it is something where. You know, it, it is a very good pick for Kamala Harris. He will be the vice president of the United States. And I, I think he will actually create problems for him because let's face it, you're that, you know, plus five R to plus, you know, you know, to to plus five D in the center. You know, you kind of those middle people which have been elusive for Trump. You think Vance is going to pick those people up or do you think? Tim Walls is going to pick those people up because it's going to be Tim Walls. It's one of the reasons why, I mean, he, you know, Trump is so scared about the people that he's lost. That's why he's trying to get RFK Jr. to drop out and endorse him is because he can't afford to lose any votes. And I don't think Tim Walls is going to help him at all in regards to that. I mean, think about what you just said there. I mean, you, you go through and I look at I look at Tim Walls as uh, aggressively normal. Uh, he's yes. extremely normal. Yeah. Yes. Uh, again, versus increasingly weird. And the fact that you brought RFK Jr. in for Trump for a Trump endorsement, a guy who picked up a dead beer bear and left a dead bear in his car for hours because he was going to go home and skin it and eat it. Um, I, I don't know what, what hole we've fallen into, but it, it, it's a weird one. Well, it is. And OK, first of all, RFK Jr., guys, I think we all have to come to grips the guy's got some mental health issues and he seriously needs help. Now, how he got into this position where he's running, he, he clearly, he's got some, he's got some problems. That being said, this is why walls saying you're weird. I don't know why it's so refreshing and nuanced as it is. It's just reality. Trump, is weird. Vance is weird. Speaker Johnson is weird. Tom Emmer, the huge jar of Elmer's glue we got up here. He's a weirdo. 
they're all weirdos. And that's not being mean saying it. It's us just looking at their behavior and looking at what they're saying and saying, you guys are weird, man. You know, it's, it's we've finally found a word for what we've always known all along that these aren't normal people. They don't have normal ideas. These aren't people who have, uh, I think, the country's best interest at heart or at mind. It's all about them. But I think weird does does kind of encapsulate all of it. Yeah, I absolutely think it does. And, you know, it's it is interesting because let's face it. The, the Republicans were so convinced they were going to win this against Joe Biden. They went out and blabbed about Project 2025. They they basically, you know, ignored the, 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 that that was really scary. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you saw the Rolling Stone article where most of those initiatives are polling below 20 percent. I mean, it, it is a terrifying thing, which has really hurt them because that's what they're going to do and they can't deny it. And so they thought things were going to go one way. And all of a sudden, Biden steps aside. Kamala Harris becomes the 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 the, the, the nominee, and she picks out. I mean, I I think when you look at Trump's three choices, Burgum was never going to help him in North Dakota. I don't know why he was there, and the one he should have gone with is Rubio because down in Florida they've got that pro uh, pro abortion rights constitutional amendment which needs sixty percent to pass. I just talked to uh, Representative Maxwell Frost down there in Florida 10, he said it's polling at 62%, which means the end of Rick Scott down there. It means that state goes blue in the election like they did under Obama. And so I think that I think that he had a chance to pick one and he went for the creepy dude with the eye makeup. I don't know what Ranger Rick is doing over there, but Johnny Mabelie needs to tone it down. Hey, I had a golf stage too. But, you know, yeah. I'm 55 now. I've grown out of it. <laughs> making... and meanwhile, you have on the Democratic side, I mean, you look at Shapiro, Bashir, Kelly, all of them had pluses, a few minuses. But overall, they were a pretty good group. I, I think you could have made an argument with anyone. But Walt just comes in with this. It's, it's, it's a practical brutalness, which it's not intended to be brutal, but it's just practical. You guys are weird. And no, and, and what he does, what he does, that. Matt, is he he reaches that rural working class voter that the Democrats yeah. have had historically a hard time with. It's hard to, to look past Tim Walls, you know, state champion football coach, social studies teacher, you know, you know, uh, you veteran. Know, veteran, all that. It's hard to look past that while you're calling him the most liberal uh, governor ever overseeing the hellscape that is one of the happiest places on earth. Well, and the, uh, Kamala Harris, in, in, in vice president, when she was introducing him, said he was the highest ranking of, en, en, enlisted man to ever serve in Congress, which is I didn't realize that. I, I thought that was pretty impressive um, from his National Guard days. And as a veteran myself, I appreciate that. You go to the labor issue, though, and this is what's been interesting. You and I have over the years lamented of the fact that you've had organizations, labor groups, who have endorsed Republicans. And it's mind numbing. It is mind numbing when the Republicans, all they have done is wipe out workers' rights, wipe out unions and do this. And and you see people who, for whatever reason, their social, their social issues they wanna endorse, whatever, fine. The reality is, is you're, you're basically dancing on the razor's edge by endorsing a Republican as a union. Since Walls was announced, I got to tell you, even a lot of the, 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 the unions in this state who have thrown forward, um, you know, the occasional Republican endorsements, all of them have gotten behind Walls because Governor Walls has been out there yeah. and he has he has put forward projects, infrastructure bills. I mean, not just the, the stuff that Joe Biden championed, but as well, the things that he has done here in Minnesota and lots of improvements, lots of infrastructure, lots of good jobs for working people. And I think an overall, if I was to pick one thing, which really was the deciding factor for Kamala Harris to go with Tim Walls over the other choices, it was the fact that as a he is a pro-labor guy and he has been out there and he, it's not just words, it's his actions. He has gotten people to work in the state of Minnesota. No, no. And for me, that was... You know, he was my second choice. I Pete Mayor Pete was my first, only because I wanted to see Pete go after JD Vance in a debate. That's well, yeah. all. I wanted to see the the nice pit bull rip JD Vance apart. But Wall, but Walls was the guy that I, you know, this is this is this is your next door neighbor. Uh, this is the guy that you want to have a beer with. 
uh, and who has done really great things. So let me ask you this, because, you know, we're seeing these attacks on on walls and, you know, sadly, you know, going after his military service, uh, I guess Tampon Tim is, is now a thing. I just, you know, they're, of course, now, first of all, they all came out. It's like, well, thank God it's Tim Walls. This is the guy we wanted to go after. That They were going to say that no matter who it was. Right. They're trying to spin this as, a, as some sort of, you know, you know, you know, he's a bad guy. The reality is, is that there's nothing. I mean, do they really want to come on out there and attack veterans? Well, I mean, I guess Trump has, and Trump has done that. Good luck as a veteran myself. Screw you. Uh, on top of that. You know, you, you, you can go after whatever issue they want to. He's liberal, he's abortion rights. Okay, so you guys who have been destroyed by the, the overturning of Roe v. Wade for two, basically over two years now, you guys want to go back to the no options for anyone else, get rid of in vitro fertilization? Fine, that's the stance you want to take. There is no way they can attack Tim Walls that doesn't end up being a self-inflicted wound on themselves. Like I said, I you can go with the, the George Floyd stuff that happened here. The people that that basically are attacking him, saying he didn't do enough, are the same ones who think Derek Chauvin was innocent for murdering George Floyd in the streets, which we all saw them do. And yet they still insist that that Derek Chauvin had a right to kill a black man in the streets. And and that is there isn't a single attack they can't put on him that can't come back and blow up in their face. Yeah. I mean, they I saw another one uh, of the, the great John Fugel saying made this point. He said. The same people that are upset with Tim Walls about getting felons their voting rights back are the same people who want to vote for a felon. And so it's just, it's, you know, there is nothing, you know, it is going to be self-inflicted wounds. That's all we're looking at here yeah. with these guys. And, you know, it's it's going to be kind of fun to watch, frankly. No, I bring up the tampon th- Tim thing because I think it's hysterical uh, that heaven forbid you put tampons in, in school bathrooms so heaven that people forbid, can use yes. them um, and for free while the Republicans during the RNC were wearing them on their ears. Yes, that was, I mean, in in a fashion look, you know, almost as good as heavy eyeliner. But, you know, I'll I'll leave that to to, to, uh, J.D. Vance, who, once again, who doesn't love the cure? No, (laughs) I haven't heard that in a long time. So bringing this back back to a national message, because, you know, a lot of people didn't know who Tim Walls was. I did because, look, I've been to Minnesota. He's done some really great labor things like banning non-competes and banning uh, captive audience meetings uh, for for union uh, organizing. There's been a lot of really great stuff. They go, yeah, more of that, please. Yeah. Um, You know, in the coming weeks, days, weeks and months, uh, the rollout of who he is. What are you anticipating? I, I think obviously one of the things, I mean, the, 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 the mentality is by the right is going to be, oh, he's some sort of San Francisco liberal. Now, first of all, okay, guys, weak attack. Minneapolis St. Paul is liberal as hell. You know, come on, you can go with the Minneapolis St. Paul liberal. You don't have to bring San Francisco into that. We just go with the hometown thing. Especially when said, J.D. Vance lived in San Francisco. Oh, yeah, exactly. When he attacked him there, and he's like, you you lived there for four years there, hippie. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, they're going to come after him on this. And the reality, I, I think it's it just, it's who he has always been. He's always been this very practical person. He is a moderate Democrat. He is a moderate Democrat. Maybe not as moderate as Clinton or Obama, but he's a moderate. But at the end of the day, He's still a Democrat, first and foremost. That was so impressive about all those bills that he signed, is that clearly there were some negotiations between the House and the Senate and the governor's office on what needed to get passed, and some of them were fairly liberal. He only vetoed one bill, and that was a bill for pay for Uber Lyft drivers, which they since then have negotiated out. Everything else, no matter if it was liberal, progressive, was it was moderate, Everything else he signed. And one of the things which I point out to 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 people is that uh, let's go with Dean Phillips, the, the Minnesota third representative who ran against Biden. If Dean Phillips was the governor of the state of Minnesota, half of those bills would have been sent back to the Democrats saying, as a Democratic governor, he would have sent those bills back saying, you need to work with some of the Republicans on this stuff. Yeah. What are you doing, man? No, you've got to be a Democrat first and foremost. And the thing is, is that you don't have to basically beg to sit at the Republican lunch table to be a proud Democrat and show that you have, you know, populist ideals. 
Tim Walls is the the epitome of that. A pro hunting guy, a pro labor guy. The biggest tax cuts in the state of Minnesota's history was under his watch. He has been a boon for the state, and he is he's done so being a moderate, but also remembering he's a Democrat. They yeah. want to try to paint him in a corner. Good luck with that, because I'll tell you what, I've seen the images of Governor Walls. I've seen the images of J.D. Vance. The more that you give him the opportunity to present himself for who he is, the more J.D. Vance looks weirder. And that is an important thing. No, the, 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 don't let him anywhere near the couch cushions. Um, <laughs> do not check for change in between the cushions. <laughs> do not do that, sir. Stop it. No, but I, I look it. at him as, you know, uh, and I don't say this about many Democrats. I I, I see him as a get her done kind of Democrat. Yep. Uh, you know, that kind oh. of that rural kind of swagger, uh, that that old school, you know, working class Democrat that I think the party needs to come back to. Yep. Uh, you know, maybe got a little bit too far off to one one side, back to getting stuff done, back to creating jobs, back to you know building family. I, I'm 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 thrilled with this pick. Yeah, he you you just said it perfectly. You know what? You and I have been this for a long time. I've talked to a lot of Democrats. Some of the Democrats, okay, yeah, they're yes. You know, I want to work with the other side. Well, okay, good for you. Um, the others, the, the, there are Democrats you meet who are they have their own ideals. They're all within the Democratic Party, and they don't forget that they're Democrats. And by doing so, and this is the great trick, by being a proud Democrat you become a good leader. And it's not just a moderate Democrat thing. I'll bring up the late, great Paul Wellstone. He was as progressive as any Democrat ever out there. And people voted for him that were Republicans. Why? Because he was honest and he told you what he was going to do. And he told you the benefit it was what he was going to do. Too many, if your first go-to stance is, I need to work with the other side of the aisle first and foremost, you're losing. And you're missing the point. And I think that that's what the the real value of what what Tim Walls brings here is. He's yeah. one of those Democrats who's you know what? Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Going back to that that ex- the first time I talked to him and that example about why you fund food um, assistance for the needy, how it helps the farmer, how it helps the hungry person. It's just a practicality you can't deny. And like I said, you want to try to label him as something other than he is. This ain't your standard Democrat. He is not going to take it. And the reality is his record's going to smack you back right in the face, like no, a no. two by four. This was a, this was a great pick by Kamala Harris. Yep. Uh, tells me she's in it to win it. Uh, yep. She was willing to pick somebody who may, in certain areas, outshine her. That is a great thing. But Matt, I appreciate the time. As always, great talking with you. Don't stay away so long. Uh, by, by all means, and by, you're always welcome back on my show as well, sir. Good stuff. Our good friend, Matt McNeil, afternoon host there at KTNF AM 950 in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Want to hear your thoughts? Um, you know, good pick? I think yes. Uh, back after this. Stick around. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, exciting day on the presidential ticket information as, you know, we got a, got a, a VP candidate. Uh, I like Tim Walls. Uh, but here's the thing. The big issue for a lot of folks, and I heard a little bit of it, uh, you know, a big immigration, kind of a big issue. Uh, but how we deal with immigration, I think, is just as big a, of an issue. You know, as I've been saying for years, I do put a lot of blame on on past decisions by administrations to cut foreign aid, uh, to, to back up immigration, immigrants coming in, to do a lot of things that, I don't know, maybe we should have done differently, policy being a big part of this. So we've got this crisis at the border. We've got this situation. And how are we handling it? Uh, that's why I've asked Aaron Siegel McIntyre to come talk with us. She's an investigative journalist, also a contributor over at Mother Jones. Got a new piece coming out. Uh, the the Border Patrol's culture of impunity enables bad behavior and sometimes keeps it from public view. That will be released today. Uh, Aaron, thanks for taking time for us. Rick, thanks so much for having me on. It's so, pleasure to so, so look, you you have this this influx of people. You've got all of this 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 this. I hate to use the word chaos, but you got this this chaos going on, 
and we're not handling it. We're we're using it as a uh, a political football. Uh, it seems like the problem is more important than the solution, and it's left on the people who are who are at the border, the border patrol people, the people who are there. Uh, how are we doing? Yeah, you know, Rick, it, it's chaos is a tough word. I, I will say that it has been kind of chaotic, I think is it's fair to say. And I, I think many Border Patrol agents would agree, right? Our sort of the trickle down effects of our outdated, broken immigration policy at the very top level, you know, that that creates a lot of complications when it comes to the rank and file agents who are on the front lines, right? They you know, in most cases, they are doing the very best they can with limited resources, with continually changing priorities. Um, a lot of them, especially over the past 10 years, have been asked to do things and to, you know, execute in situations that they're not trained for, right? Border Patrol agents are trained to find people, to track people, to apprehend people. You know, they're not trained to care for children in big facilities, for example, like makeshift tents. That's that's not what most agents signed up to do, nor do they have training for that. Right. And so when we think about you know, what's going on, why are things so chaotic? You know, apprehensions now over the past month are they've, they've dropped, they've halved. Things are much calmer recently. But there is always this up and down, this ebb and flow that agents have to respond to. And, you know, it's tough. The, the agency's been in a tough place. It's a highly politicized agency. I would argue that many of our elected officials um, up to the very top in D.C. oftentimes don't actually know what they're talking about when they do things like say, hey, we need 5,000 more agents to, to work the line. You know, the agency already has an incredibly hard time both recruiting and retaining agents. Every time the force is tasked with like a big ballooning expansion, you know, that that creates problems of, of different kinds. And if we look back to history, which is something I think I'd also argue we don't maybe do enough in this country at times. When we look back to, you know, post 2003, when the Department of Homeland Security was founded, right, that the Border Patrol was reorganized. They got kind of shuttled over to be underneath that new Homeland Security umbrella. And things changed pretty radically. President Bush at the time also called for this big expansion. And so, you know, in order to fulfill that mandate, the agency did what it could. CBP did what it could. They tweaked the hiring standards. Um, some have described it as dropping the standards, which... No, they, they grabbed warm bodies. They grabbed anybody willing. Exactly. You know, beggars can't be choosers kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, I mean, ask any police department that needs to expand quickly. You know, if you're not hiring the best candidates, if your vetting is even a little bit subpar, you're going to have to carry the consequences of that down the road. And more often than not, it's it's not very pretty. No, no. And this is where I think your your investigative report is, is important, because as you point out over the last, uh, I guess it's the last two decades, you've had uh, what is it? 186 alleged incidents of sexual harassment, uh, sexual assault, rape, uh, other other things. You know, not just you know, um, you know, committed by, but perpetrated against border patrol agents. Uh, this is this is a problem. It is. It is, and that that specific data set is, quite frankly, the tip of the iceberg. The problem is determining. Well, how big is that iceberg, right? I know for a fact, so this this data set, these 186 incidents are, you know, alleged crimes, misconduct of a sexual nature. A lot of different stuff falls under that umbrella. But um, I know that CBP and the federal government weren't really going through the details very carefully when they compiled that list, which, you know, I obtained via Freedom of Information Act request, right? There's laws that are around that, that, that guide how information is released. Right. And there are quite a number of very high profile incidents that have been reported in the media, mainstream media, that are not on that list. There are some glaring omissions. So that's that's what I mean when I say it's sort of the tip of the iceberg. I know it's not complete. Because I was going to ask you, I go, you know, 186, obviously for those people is, is, a, is a big number, but over a 20 year period, you know, 186, no. given the kind <laughs> of the kind of power disparity, given the kind of situation that it is, seems like a very low number. Um, yeah. You know, given the, again, I go back to that, that power dynamic of, 
you, you've brought all these people in to control desperate people. It seems to me that there could be a recipe for, for much worse, uh, a, a bigger disaster, if you will. Yeah, you know, and I, I think what I've learned in my reporting and my research over the past 10 years on, on this agency is that what we know really isn't the whole picture, especially when it comes to misconduct and criminal behavior by agents and wrongdoing, right? It's, you know, any government agency, any company, any any corporation for that matter, they're always going to try to spin when bad things emerge, right? And the Border Patrol, I mean, they're pretty good at it simply because they are uh, able to be so evasive. As a reporter um, for this recent piece for Mother Jones Magazine, um, I worked on it for over a year, and CBP, the parent agency of the Border Patrol, they refused to make a single Border Patrol agent available for me to talk to. Wow. And so that's that's really common. And so reporters have to kind of go around that, which is also really hard. It puts agents who are currently working for the government in a really tough spot, right? They could lose their jobs by talking to press without permission from their bosses, right? Are they going to want to ask their bosses for permission? In a lot of cases, no, that creates you know, a little bit of internal conflict that most folks don't want to deal with. On the flip side, a lot of agents want to talk about their experiences. I would argue they deserve to be able to talk publicly about what they see, what they experience. Their hands are tied in a lot of cases. And this is one of those things that I, I keep saying that, you know, you look on the national level and the political realm, uh, the problem is much more important than the solution. And what I mean by that is, it, you know, each side has got their their constituent base and their their funding streams and and keeping this an issue is keeping an industry going whereas if we were to actually solve this problem if we'd actually come up with a solution and and solve it in, in a certain way uh the the problem might go away and, and and then all of that that funding stream all of that division all of that red hat blue hat stuff might go away or am i just being you know uh, hopeful uh you know <laughs> it's a tough question right i think I think we have to be hopeful. I think we, as a country, it all goes back to what the public wants, right? What is the United States of America? What do we represent? What do we want to represent, right? Is, is this a land where we do welcome people, refugees, migrants, folks that just want to work in, let's say, a chicken plant, right? Work in jobs that we can't fill with American labor. There's a huge labor question around this, right? And our immigration policy is not really informed by that. You can look at the different kinds of visas from, you know, the real fancy ones for inventors and for the really rich folks that are going to come here and try to create businesses all the way down to like H2B, H2A visas, visas for what used to be for temporary farm workers, stuff that doesn't really exist anymore. There are so many problems in so many ways. And it is political kryptonite. Nobody will touch this issue because it is wildly unpopular. It's hard to understand. And most Americans just hear this rhetoric all the time that does come from both sides of the aisle around what immigrants are going to do or what immigration does to our workforce or our economy. There's so much misinformation. It makes it really hard to see through all the cloudiness and understand, hey, what what do we need to be doing? Where should we focus our attention? And beyond that, what do we want as a country? What, yeah. what should we be asking of our elected officials? So given this report, because again, you go through and meticulously uh, tell the story of someone who was sexually, who was raped and, and, you know, kind of, you know, laying out that there's a massive problem in this world. Um, how do we address that? I mean, is this something that the union, because uh, they're represented by, by a union, is it something that they can do? Is it something that Congress has to do? Uh, is it something that we as people, the citizens, have to demand? Where, where do you see uh, a solution coming here? Or is this just such, it's such, so out of control that maybe this is the best we can do? So I think when, when we think about misconduct, and I'm not sure if it's fair to call it a massive issue or if it's better described as a systemic challenge for this federal agency. I think I would fall more on the side of systemic challenge because it's been around for decades, right? right? We've seen it kind of peak, ebb, flow, et cetera, et cetera. But again, without 
transparency without fully knowing what's going on, it is really hard to talk about and understand, right? And so when we think about, okay, so what what is causing misconduct? Of course, we have to look at hiring and recruitment, but we also have to look at how discipline gets kind of executed at different levels within the agency. We have to look at how things like investigations are resourced, how people are trained, who are tasked with investigating allegations of misconduct. There's a lot of different places where we can look and think about ways to do better. And I think those have to be done sort of in conjunction with each other. It's not like a simple, here's a Band-Aid that will kind of fix everything. It's right. It's a bigger issue, yeah. No, you're saying it's systemic. Uh, I know a lot of people say, well, I, bad apples. A couple of bad apples doing bad things. Because in any large organization, you're going to have a couple of... You're going to have a couple of a-holes walking around who are going to do bad things. Uh, can it be forgiven as that? Or as you've said, is this something that is systemic that can be dealt with by by additional funding, by additional resources, by by more transparency, accountability, that kind of stuff? That's a really good question, Rick. And it, it's funny that you use the phrase bad apples, right? Because that's the phrase that the Border Patrol and CBP itself uses whenever there is a high profile incident that is too messy or too bombastic or too heinous to kind of contain and, and it gets out into the press and the public learns about it. They do tend to rely on this bad apple narrative with the press, which kind of insinuates that, hey, any incident is singular. You know, this is a question, again, of maybe a rogue cop or an agent gone bad. And I, I think I would argue at this point, based on my research, based on my reporting, and all of the agents and former agents I've talked to, I, I don't think we're actually talking about apples here. I... I don't think it's accurate to say it's a bad apple here and there. I think the workplace culture, I think it's better to describe it like this, right? The border patrol agents, they're more like pickles and they're in a jar, right? That jar, there's, there's a bunch of different jars. Every sector has its own shape, size, and brine, right? But all of these agents are in this culture. They're, they're, the brine is seeping in, they're in this atmosphere. The workplace culture, might turn a blind eye to certain kinds of conduct and behavior. It really depends on your station, who you are, who you're friends with. There's a lot of factors at play. Discipline for one kind of offense in, let's say, Tucson sector might be different from the way San Diego sector handles it. It kind of depends on a lot of factors again. And so, you know, the characteristics of the workplace are not uniform, and it makes it a really complicated issue to A, grasp, and B, try to push in a way towards reforming anything. Now, I got to imagine, because, look, I, I believe the majority of Border Patrol agents want to come and do their job and do the best that they can, and, and they want to serve the country, and they want to do all those high-minded things that we, we, you know, we, we hope and want from them. And yet there are some that are your bottom feeders, I think they want changes. I think they want better training, better accountability, more transparency, all that stuff. Or again, am I just being overly hopeful? No, you're not being overly hopeful, right? It's it's a workforce like any workforce. But, you know, what's what's different, I think, about the Border Patrol in particular is the fact that it is a job where, you know, you are holding a significant level of power right? You are on the front lines. It's a position that is very susceptible to bad actors trying to bribe agents to do things like pass people through checkpoints, to smuggle drugs. There's, It's a highly corruptible position. And so these agents have to be really, really carefully vetted, carefully trained. You have to have a certain fortitude to make it as an agent in a lot of different ways, but that includes standing up to some of the temptations that might come across while you're doing your job. And so, you know, is it a workforce that just has, like you were saying before, more bad apples? I don't think so, but there is a lot of temptation and there are systemic problems. They come from somewhere and it does go back to the workplace culture, goes back to training at the academy as well. Um, and it goes back to, again, how discipline is handled, how supervisors are trained, it's, there's a lot of factors at play here. No, I see. I'm, I'm going to be more along the lines of um, these these type of jobs attract certain kind of people. And some of those people uh, overwhelmingly have power trip issues, uh, have control issues. And when you have this kind of imbalance in power, 
uh, or where you have someone who has power and obviously people who have none, uh, that is a recipe for disaster. So out of this investigative report that you've done, what are you hoping com comes out of this? Because I can see that people are going to attack this going, well, you're just taking cheap shots at the border uh, patrol officers. Um, you know, so what, what's what's the hope out of this? Yeah, you know, I, I think nothing in this piece or in my work takes any cheap shots at anybody whatsoever. I think it's fair. And I think what I write about and report is absolutely accurate. And so I do it through a lens of empathy for agents because there are quite a number of agents who, you know, when somebody commits a heinous crime, let's say when somebody murders a prostitute, right, that's a Border Patrol agent, that tarnishes the badge for everybody else. That's not something agents want to live with, right? right? Nobody wants to have bad cops in their midst. It's a problem everybody knows exists, and it does deserve a solution. And so I think my hope for doing articles like this, A, are that the conversation advances a little bit and that we can talk about some of these systemic issues. We can talk about how complaints are handled or not handled. And we can start talking about what we can do better instead of just treating the Border Patrol like they're either all villains or all heroes. Because quite frankly, it's, it's a very big gray area. And there are a lot of agents too that would say, we need to do better why does this keep happening? Why no, it's, the same, it's the same thing with law enforcement overall. And it's this whole, the whole reason when they were doing that whole uh, defund the police nonsense. I was going, no, no, I support the police uh, when they're not wrong. Uh, when they're wrong, we hold them accountable like we with with anyone else. And the same thing with the Border Patrol officers. Uh, I support them 100 percent when they're not doing wrong. Right. And that, Rick, that's where I think the role of the press really matters here. And it's it's so frustrating because it is so hard to report on the border patrol. It is so hard to crack through the green wall and get actual information that, you know, when we talk about accountability, when we talk about, you know, helping police agencies do better, we can't do any of that unless we know what's going on. There you go, Aaron. I appreciate you taking time for us. Great report. Hope folks will take a look at it. We'll get links out on social media. Uh, you can take a look at Crossing the Line, the Border Patrol's culture of impunity enables bad behavior and sometimes keeps it from public view, written by Aaron Siegel McIntyre. Aaron, I appreciate the time. I'd uh, love to talk to you again sometime down the road. Sounds great, Rick. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Want to hear your thoughts. Uh, I know this is gonna this is gonna generate a lot of email. So uh, angry stuff to the top, as always. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. I want to hear your thoughts. Quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. This day in labor history, the year was 1890. That was the day that one of the heroines of the U.S. labor movement, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, was born in Concord, New Hampshire. Elizabeth learned her progressive politics at a young age. Her father was a socialist and her mother a feminist. Elizabeth was kicked out of high school for speaking out in favor of socialism. This did not slow her down. She kept speaking and her reputation grew. She became a member of the Industrial Workers of the World. She traveled the country organizing and speaking to workers. From the Minnesota Iron Range to the textile mills of Lawrence, Massachusetts, Elizabeth was on the front lines of the labor struggle. She was arrested for her activity 10 times, but was never sentenced. During World War I, Flynn was arrested and stood trial for speaking out against the war. The experience led her to become one of the founders of the American Civil Liberties Union, an organization dedicated to protecting freedom of speech. In the 1930s, Flynn became a member of the U.S. Communist Party, writing a regular column for the Daily Worker. But despite her personal political ideas, she supported Democratic Party President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1944. During the 1950s, she was caught up in the anti-communist hysteria led by Senator Joe McCarthy. She went to prison for two years for allegedly violating the Smith Act. 
a law against overthrowing the government. She died while on a visit to Russia in 1964. More than 20,000 people attended her funeral there. A monument to Flynn stands at the Forest Home Cemetery just outside of Chicago, where she is buried alongside the graves of Eugene Dennis, Big Bill Haywood, and the Haymarket Martyrs. For more information, go to LaborHistoryIn2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at LaborHistoryIn2. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. So on Monday, you had uh, the the D.C. Circuit judge uh, who uh, said Google, (laughs) Monopoly, uh, historic. I mean, this is a big, big freaking deal. Uh, The first time in, what, a quarter of a century that we've gone after one of these monopolistic corporations and said, hey, uh, you're, you're breaking the law. And, and we'll see what the remedy will be. For me, it's about it's it should be about breaking this up and creating more competition, doing away with uh, the non-compete agreements, which understand the courts are about ready to, to block and make make non-competes great again so that these big corporations can hold people hostage in their ranks for menial bits of information so that. The, the, the knowledge that they might gain from employment, the expertise that they may have gotten through a career of, uh, of working for different places will never turn into a new business. And, and you know, that's, that's how big corporations like it. Now, with the Google thing, and as I said, this is kind of a big freaking deal uh, that you had this, this judge uh, come out and say, yeah, they're, uh, they're breaking the law. Uh, now it's time to maybe look at some other things. And I said... Uh, on Tuesday, look, we should be going after these big grocery chains. We should be going after all of these industries that are controlled by two, three corporations, maybe four. We should be going after that and, and recreating uh, local businesses uh, and, and more competition instead of these giant behemoths that, well, there's no real competition. It's more like, you know, algorithmic collusion. And, and, the other place that we should be looking at is our media. The fact that you have these these huge, you know, media conglomerates, you have this mass consolidation, and understand our media has been been systematically dismantled from the Reagan era forward, with the end of the fairness doctrine, uh, all the way up to Bill Clinton signing the Telecom Bill of '96, that allowed for the ownership of, you know. It used to be that you couldn't own a radio and TV station in the same market. It used to be that you couldn't own a newspaper and and you couldn't own a bunch of things that you had, you know, sole coordination of message. Uh, Now, understand, the media companies, what they want is they want to be able to own the local TV station, the radio station, and what used to be newspapers. And what they would do is they would fire two of the three reporters and they would just replicate that one reporter's work across all three platforms, saving them a boatload of money. Good for the bottom line. Good for profits. Now, the industry, well, screw them. Uh, Because I I read somewhere where someone said, look, you know, in in my lifetime, and this this is my lifetime, he's talking about, that we went from um, having twice as many reporters uh, to multiples more population. So we've got less reporters, more people. And I look at, you know, companies like Sinclair Broadcasting. There was a great commercial done uh, a couple a couple of years back where they took all of the local hosts of the Sinclair Broadcasting Network and they pieced together, you know, a commentary that was given to all of them to read across the board. And it was kind of eerie to see that you had all of these different local people that you think are, hey, it's you and me, buddy, uh, you know, saying something that in every market is being repeated. That is eh, a bit Orwellian. But for me, this is an opportunity to use some of this power to break up, you know, big pharma, break up some of these these big conglomerates and our media being a big part of that. Uh, bringing some bit of local back bringing some bit of actual reporting back. Now, I know in the age of the internet, uh, I, I, hear, I hear this all the time, we got more choices than ever. And maybe we should be looking for more journalistic voices than, 
just the loudest and the the most obnoxious uh, who keep telling us the craziest stuff. And I look at this, the attacks on Tim Walls. Quite remarkable. I mean, this is a guy, this is an every guy. Uh, this is this is your neighbor. This is your your this is the dad from next door, and they're go they are going to rip into him and try and make everything that's ever happened in this man's life some kind of giant conspiracy, some liberal conspiracy where, you know, Tim Walls is is going to tear the country apart. When here's a guy who takes care of his family. Here's a guy who is the, the dude next door. You know, as I, I said on Twitter, there's a guy I want to have a beer with. Solve all the world problems while we argue over a football game. That's the Tim Walls. And like I said, I think uh, Kamala Harris made the right choice. I think he's a good choice. I think he's someone that people are going to connect with, especially working class voters. And that has got the right losing their minds. Because he's extremely normal. His family is like, like our family. Here's a guy who I'm sure at one point knew what it was like to have to worry about putting food on the table, keeping a roof over the kids' heads. This is a working class guy who had to roll up the sleeves and as a teacher work a second job, had to dig into his pockets for school supplies. This is a guy who's going to bring working class ideals to the public forum. And that's why we should love him for it. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program, make sure you grab the podcast. Or if you get your favorite podcast, you'll find ours uh, for videofreespeech.org. Everything right there. Uh, and hey, you know, thanks for being here. As always, great seeing you. Look forward to seeing you back here again next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick. Email Rick. At Rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.